Hello everyone. I'm gonna wiggle this around. Um, yeah, hi, I'm Lucy, for those of you who don't know me, and I see a few friendly faces, because everyone from Lotto Land turns up, which isn't at all intimidating, but thanks. <laughs> um, so as a designer, when I heard the title, Data-Driven Product Design, uh, I was like, yes, great, get in, it's got the title, Design, in it. So I was like, yeah, cool. And then, if you're anything like me, your second thought is, oh my god, data. And it drives fear into the very heart of me, but actually the one thing to remember with all of this is that data is just a measure. It's a measure of what real people do in real situations with real products and real features. So, if anyone out there is wondering what on earth is a designer standing up here talking about data-driven products for, about five minutes ago I was probably wondering the same thing. Uh, in the interest of why I'm up here though, um, sort of scared, alone, slightly sweaty, um, I will continue. So this is what UX designers do, and this on the right is what people think UX designers do. <laughs> so on the right, the visible to everyone things that a UX designer does will often end in like a visual design, uh, maybe a wireframe, maybe an interface. But what people don't often see is the stuff that went into making all of that. So let's focus in just for a second on the term user research. So one of the ways that data is important to designers or products um, is user research. Now research is just informing you, it's not actually making your decisions for you unfortunately, um, but it's just helping you to actually make better ones. So informed design is successful design, and successful design means successful products, and successful products can contribute to a successful business. So data is making you, your user's experience, and your product smarter than ever before. Only two industries refer to their customers as users, computer design and drug dealing. <laughs> so what do I mean when I say user research? So at the base of it, it seems really simple. It's like asking people questions and then listening to what they say. I kind of wish it was that simple, my job would be a lot easier. Um, but basically there are some different types of user research um, and they're quantitative and qualitative and you can quantify the qualitative as well in case you get people who, you know, as you mentioned, super hung up on like uh, numbers. Um, but basically let me just go through what we've gone through as a whole uh, world. We've gone from getting your camera film developed at the chemists and finding out they're all out of focus and wonky and they're of your feet um, to Instagram. And we've gone from producing a movie to uploading a vlog on YouTube in minutes. We've gone from writing a book to writing a blog. You know, you can get instant feedback on things and our collective ability as society to create things has completely changed from a one and done deliverable to an emerging process and an ongoing process of discovery. So this should be happening in your own digital products too, and if it's not, you're actually probably missing out on quite a lot of things that you could learn along the way to create that successful product. So there are very specific nuances that using data can bring. There are, however, so many types of data to consider as well. So if you really want to focus in on the things which are important, Focus in on the things which are very closely related to goals and outcomes. Most modern analytics tools give you things straight out of the box which you can start using tomorrow. It allows you to measure things, but just make sure that those things are the things that you care about. Because actually, if you drop 20% clicks on a page, that doesn't actually have a massive impact on your uh, net revenue straight away. It's not, a, it's not a key performance thing that's tied very closely to any change like that. And for the designers amongst you, hi, um, but don't let the term data-driven kind of fool you into thinking that all creativity has just been completely lost in this big data monolith. It's not like that. Ideas and insights and creativity have a massive part to play. Often they form the basis of any feature or product as well. So it's good to contain that ideation as well as listen to the data and what that's saying. Now, I'm not going to dispel this myth at all, but size does matter, guys. <coughs> Now it's important to remember not just to concentrate on the macro conversions, like we are super obsessed with like measuring how many people registered, how many new customers do we have, how many people bought the pair of shoes that they came here to buy. Getting a customer to do that is all well and good, but actually remember to focus on the micro conversions as well. Those micro conversions like reading an article, signing up to a newsletter, Anything like that could ultimately lead to a macro conversion and sometimes they're just as important to be tracking. So 
it's all about making that balance between what you're tracking and what you're measuring and making sure those things are important to you. Now, a little secret as well. No manager said that they really want data. Managers want to be influenced by data and they want to focus on solving problems that advance the business because actually not everybody understands data to the degree that a lot of people in this room do. So lots of people do try and fill this with like visualizations like fancy bar charts and pie charts and graphs and like correlation diagrams and it all looks very good. But remember you can actually turn that into a little bit of insight just with a few simple questions. So try and focus on what happened why it happened, and then what actions are you going to take, even if that's nothing. So instead of app installs dropped by 5%, you could turn that into a really good piece of insight by saying, app installs dropped by 5% this week, as in compared to last week. That's a proper KPI that probably has a real big impact on what your business does. It probably happened because we dropped position from the valuable search terms, and instead of being in position one, we ended up in position three. So this shows like a likely related factor. It's something that you can kind of understand. You might be able to look back on the data you've previously had and said, look, when we've changed position, this has had an impact before. And we should take action on this to avoid dropping further, looking into maybe if we updated the description and we fell out because of that, or looking at maybe if something else has changed. Maybe we could look at improving the core offering in our app to make those ratings go up, to get even higher rankings so that we maintain that position. So a lot of things to concentrate on. The other angle I really want to talk about as well is qualitative data. So I really want to go in depth in this because it's actually something that was mentioned previously about something that a, a UX and UI team is, is quite good at really getting a hold of because we're talking, we've got the name users in our title so you kind of hope that we do that a bit. Um, but usability tests are basically where you watch someone try and complete a task that you set them like by the shoes. Uh, you watch what they do, you watch where they click you watch what's happening. It's useful to also get them to speak out loud because you know what, we're not mind readers either. We don't know why you've done what you've done. And it'll sound really freaky. It'll sound really weird. A good user test sounds mad. Well, I'm just moving my mouse over to the button and I'm looking for something that will let me select the shoe size. Like it does sound a bit mad, but actually we can't read minds, so it's super useful to do. So let me show you my all time favorite graph. Yes. I'm that person, I've got a favourite graph. <laughs> now I love this graph. Okay, this graph um, is uh, basically the output of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of usability <coughs> studies. This is a graph that I really like to show all my stakeholders to, but it's actually from Nielsen Norman Group, who is like um, the sort of worldwide leading influence on usability. It basically shows in this one graph how cheap easy and fast it is to find the biggest problems with either your current thing or if you can get a prototype done, the future thing that you want to build. It's also really important to look at where this graph starts. If you test zero people, you get zero insights. If you test one person, you'll learn so much. If you test two, you will learn more. If you test three, you will learn a little bit more as well, but you might start to hear those, that third person repeat what the second and first person said. If you test four, you're going to hear a lot of the same stuff and learn a little. And by five, you were so bored of listening to the same users have the same problems over again that you kind of just want to stop. Now, the trick with this is to do this iteratively. Find your biggest problems with five people. Fix things. Start with the biggest problems. Prioritize them. How many people encountered the issue? Then we'll fix that first. How severe was it? So did it stop people from actually completing the task that we set them to do, buy the shoes? Or well, they couldn't buy it because they couldn't find the buttons. That's a big issue. So basically, fix the problems, then test with another five users. Those other five users will find the next biggest problems for you. You will fix them again. You will then test with five more users. So with just three rounds of very small scale testing, testing 15 people, you can figure out what the problems are in the product before you've even touched anything. So let's go through how you might run a usability test. And there's two very popular ways of doing this. Here are two examples. So on the left, you've got unmoderated. And as the title suggests, you don't moderate this. Um, it's basically just setting up some questions. So to complete some tasks, 
screen's recorded, sometimes the person's face is recorded as well, which can be a bit fun because you can see them, you see them sitting there and the camera is on their face and they're going, yeah, I really like this, this is great. And you can see they just hate it. <laughs> Secondly, you can do moderated testing as well. So you're actually there in the room. This is super useful to do if you have something that's not quite working yet, not everything's completely done, like maybe it's a prototype, maybe it's only got a few screens connected together very crudely. So if somebody clicks somewhere, you can kind of help them get them back and stuff. So um, it's good with a moderated test as well to maybe have a couple of observers. So one, somebody focused on taking notes, maybe. Somebody focused on watching body language. I once had a guy so horrified at an interface that we were showing him, he wheeled his chair away from the desk where the, where the desktop was and he looked and he looked panicked. And we said, OK, so how would you use the system to do this task? And he was like, well, I'd probably just click here. I'd probably do that. And he wasn't coming back to that desktop interface. If we'd been doing some unmoderated testing, we wouldn't have seen how much he actually hated that interface and wouldn't even try to use it. So it's a bit of an art to figure out exactly the questions that you should ask. But actually, um, just don't ask things like, why did you absolutely love this thing that you used? It's more about just asking, how did you find that? What did you think about that? Neutral questions, non-leading questions, questions without bias. So usability isn't about subjective opinion, like the amount of times that I've heard this, oh, well, why would we only trust a few people who say some stuff? It's not about, I like the color, I don't like the thing. You are just looking at tasks. You are looking whether people understood the thing. Did they know the text? Did they find the button? Did, were they able to do the thing you set in front of them, like buy the shoes? Could they change the size? Did they pick the right colour? Did they complete that or did they struggle? Could they find it? Could they see it? Did they spend so long doing it that it was just not worth it anymore? So it's important to recognise usability's importance to the success of a business as well. So IBM reports every single dollar that's invested into usability brings a return of 10 to 100. Amazon's Jeff Bezos invested in usability design a hundred times more than in marketing during that portal's first year. According to him, this strategy was the one that led to Amazon's overall success. It is that important to be testing your stuff. So, let me explain why qualitative and quantitative work best when they go hand in hand. Now, this is a terrible story about me, okay? So I once spent six months, six months of my life I did interviews, I went out on the road, I visited branches, I talked to customers, I made prototypes, I changed underlying infrastructure, I worked with third parties, I planned out a product roadmap based on one idea. There was a massive application form, we needed to reduce it. It was 26 pages long, it was insane. It, no, everyone was like, why is this so long? One question every page, yes. Questions that didn't even make sense, yes. And you just had to press it to continue, it was so bad. So we knew we were doing the right thing by looking at this and fixing this anyway, but we used data to have a look at what the conversion rate was. We looked at the overall conversion and we looked at the screen to screen conversion. People would drop off massively when they were asked stupid questions, it was quite obvious. What happened was we put that live. We didn't have the chance to test it in a controlled manner, in a control group, as Laura mentioned. We didn't have that opportunity, so we just had to put it live and hope for the best. Conversion dropped by 20%. I have never been so scared in my life. I was thinking, what am I going to do? I'm going to lose my job. So I'd done everything right. Like, what was the problem? Why hadn't this actually worked? Well, it turns out there wasn't actually a problem. Nothing was wrong. What I'd done is I'd focused on the very, very first part of that conversion. I'd looked at the drop in the very first two screens from the product page to start to register. So then I thought, right, I need to look at more. Um, basically, because users had qualified themselves, because of the improved information on the product page, they had already decided they didn't want the product at the very first step and left the page, so the conversion dropped. But every customer from then on in was so qualified, they knew what they were doing, they knew what to expect through the process, they continued. 
when I looked at the overall conversion, it had increased by 12%. So if I just focused on that one thing, well, I probably wouldn't be standing here today. Um, but if I just looked at the qualitative information from the users that we spoke to, oh, that's, that's wonderful, I can do that. Look, this product does that, it does this, and I know what I'm doing, and that's fine. If I'd focused on either one of those individually, I would have got a wrong impression about what's going on. It's so important to marry these two things up to get that rounded picture. So, that's all well and good. That's existing stuff, yeah? But how do we make sure that the next product or feature totally rocks? So from a design point of view, the other side to user testing is validation. Validation tells you things like product market fit, interest, price points, and it's just the things that you can't imagine learning from small-scale usability testing. <coughs> validate, validate, validate is the key message here. If you are going to be spending that much time and effort doing something, somebody just check that it's going to work, that people like it, that it's a thing, that the price is okay, that the copy's understood. Somebody just check. So you start by basically one thing, define your assumptions. What do you assume to be true that you don't actually have any proof of? What do you ha not have any concrete data about? Because if you move forward on an assumption, the product could fail. But actually, there's some very easy ways that you can make sure that doesn't happen. Create an experiment. It's something you can learn from. And basically, you don't need to build the whole singing, dancing app, website feature to work out if this is something that's a thing. There's some activities you can do to protect you, your team, your business from making this mistake. A couple of ideas. A mobile app. So yeah, you could create a fully functioning app that does the same job or a site with some analytics just to check what's working. What do people click on? What do people engage with? What are people looking at? You could create a landing page, get some feedback, check what people are looking at. Do they always go to the price? Are they always concerned about what that price structure is on that product? Um, create a prototype, see which has the most interest, see what people use, see what people play with. But it all comes back to what the data says about this. Social advertising. So Google AdWords, Facebook ads, you could test different value propositions, product descriptions, wording, pricing. How does that really impact? Which gets the most clicks? Social media, so you can measure interest, create a conversation about the thing that you want to talk about. Is it interesting? Do users engage? Do they want this? Have they experienced it elsewhere? Do they hate it? Survey, existing customers, new customers, not your customers, anybody's customers. Um, you can use that to validate your assumptions. So. Why are experiments super important? So this is Amazon's recommendation engine. And if you've not heard of him, he's called Greg Linden. He was the engineer at Amazon um, way back in the early noughties who came up with this. It was a bit of a prototype. So it showed personalized recommendations based on items that were in the shopping cart. You add an item, it recommends stuff. You add another item, it recommends something else. So it kind of seems sensible, um, but actually, while the prototype looked very promising, uh, a marketing vice president was dead set against it. He was absolutely strictly forbidden to work on it. No, 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 no. People won't continue. People won't do the, th they won't buy the thing they came. They'll get distracted. They'll go off somewhere. They'll start looking at other reviews. So Greg ran a controlled experiment. <laughs> Uh, Greg said that the feature won by such a wide margin that not having it was actually costing Amazon a noticeable chunk of change, and you can only imagine how much that noticeable chunk of change would be. With new urgency shopping cart recommendations launched, and since then, multiple sites use this same algorithm every day, YouTube, Netflix, everything like that. So experiments are super important to your business, super important to your product. Run them in a controlled way, yes. Do multivariate testing, yes. Set up the new version on a test site. Get people around a computer, have a look at it. Usability test it, anything. Just check with real humans. So data is a great place to start and identify issues which might exist. It's a great way to quantify what you're seeing, but it's so hard to understand why from the data alone. So design can bring with it the quality of empathizing with the user being able to understand why people do what they do, it's so important to the success of a product. And data and design are just two tools that we use to shape the experience of the user. And once you have that great idea, you should still be checking that it's a great idea.
So informed design is successful design. Successful design is a successful product and a successful product can significantly contribute to the success of a business. Thank you. Questions? Yes, please. Uh, can you recommend any tools for pre-launch testing? What kind of pre-launch testing? Uh, of an app. Of an app? Yeah. Um, so it, it depends um, what kind of pre-launch testing you want to do. So if you want to do something qualitative, you can run very simple usability tests and there's lots and lots of tools that help you do that. And most tools will give you a free trial of that of three or five users. They are so invested in the success of their product that they will help you the first few times you run a test as well. There's lots of services out there. UserZoom are popular services. Um, things like, uh, we use one called Userlytics at the moment, and some of them even transcribe, even in different languages, if you have like a multi-language product as well. In terms of um, qualitative testing, there's lots of sort of multivariate testing tools and there's some inbuilt ones with analytics tools as well. So it depends exactly what you're looking for, but both are super useful. Any more? You're All right, welcome. that's cool. Good job. Thank you.